everybody and welcome. We have an absolute treat for you today. I am here with Josephine Nakakande of EcoAgric Uganda, and this is going to be the first edition of a of a new little series that we are going to be starting that we refer to as Fireside Chats. So this is our first Fireside Chat with Josephine today, and as you guys know, we have this collaboration going with EcoAgric Uganda, where we have our By the Fire Sedalian Guild and all of our gamers are playing using the Vulcan Forge blockchain gaming ecosystem to generate money, crypto tokens for themselves, but also they are generating funds for EcoAgric Uganda that we are donating to them every single Friday. And what I wanted to do with this chat while we have Josephine here with us is get a little bit of the backstory about her. So Josephine is one of the co-founders of the organization. It started back in 2007. They have done some really, really great things over the years and are continuing to do some amazing work in Uganda. And we're so honored and happy to be able to help them out and support them through this uh, blockchain gaming initiative, thanks to Vulcan Forged. And so I want this to be a little bit educational for you all to get more information on Josephine and what got her to where she is today. What uh, kind of, We'll learn about her story and how she got to the point of founding EcoAgric Uganda um, and just to get more information on her and, and how she got to the point of doing all this amazing work that she is doing. So Josephine, uh, thank you very much for joining me here today and I will pass You're it welcome. off to you now um, to give us a little bit more information about yourself. Thank you so much, Adam. And a very big thank you to everyone that is listening in and everyone that has donated crypto tokens. Thank you so much for your wonderful work. Thank you so much for your generosity and love. Yes, I'm Josephine Nakakande. Uh, I'm a female Ugandan. I was born 14th May, 1974. I'm married uh, with the two sons. Uh, one is 21 and another one is 15. So my last born is 15. Uh, I'm an, a veterinarian, an agriculturalist, a conservationist, and then a community development worker. So uh, I would like to tell you a story about myself, but I'm here to represent or to tell you that I work with an organization called Environmental Conservation and Agriculture Enhancement Uganda. And in short, I'll be calling it EcoAgric Uganda. So when you hear EcoAgric Uganda, it stands for Environmental Conservation and Agriculture Enhancement Uganda, EcoAgric Uganda. Gotcha. Now, EcoAgric Uganda, is a community member-based organization. It is a non-government organization that was established way back in 2007. It aims at improving livelihoods of the critically vulnerable and absolutely poor people in Uganda. And in short, you can refer to these people like the people who are in the middle of nowhere. These are people who never went to school, so they are illiterate. These are people who do not have food. They do not have shelter. They do not, their children do not go to school. They do not have anything. So in short, we refer to them as people who are in the middle of nowhere. Now, EcoAbric Uganda was established by four people and of which I'm among them. I'm one of the founders together with other women groups, which were two women groups, uh, one from an area called Wakiso and another one from Hoima plus four technical people. But as I've already told you that we target the critically vulnerable and absolutely poor people, those who are in the middle of nowhere, they are majorly the women the girls, the children, and the youth. Now, today I'm here to tell you why women, 
Women take the biggest percentage of the people we support. When you go to the children, most of them are girls. When you go to those supported under mushroom growing, most of them are women. Everything that we do, the biggest percentage is women. No wonder 80% of the population in Uganda depends on agriculture and the biggest percentage are women. So why women? Now, I'm going to tell my story. Each one of the founders has his or her own story, but this is, the, is my story. This is the story of Josephine Nakakande, one of the founders of EcoAgri Uganda. Now, I'm a daughter to a teacher and a housewife. Thank God, both of my friends of my parents are alive. My father is there and is together with my mother. So my mother is married to my father. They are together. Since I was born, I found them together and up to now, they are still together. And by the way, awesome. my father is my friend. I love him so much. But my mother is a hero. My father was or is a secondary school teacher. I told you we are eight. I have three sisters and four brothers. That means we are four girls and four boys. I happen to be the second born, but the first girl. That means my father is my good, good, good friend. I love my father so much. My mother is also my friend and my lovely mother. I love her so much and she's a hero. Now, my mother did not study so much. She ended in a level called senior four. She tells me after studying P8, I don't understand some of those things that she tells me. So she didn't get any qualification. And my father finished at university, at Makerere University, and became a professional secondary school teacher teaching chemistry. Now, Though my mother didn't study that much, she, after we were born, she saw that as the number of children she was giving birth to increased, the pocket or the size of my father's pocket decreased. The resources needed were increasing. The, the need of the resources was increasing but the resource pocket was not exp expanding. And my mother needed to find an alternative way of supplementing my father's income. So at this moment, my, my mother started by finding means of ensuring that we do not buy food at home. So what she did, she decided to go out and grow crops. So where we were staying at that time, we were staying in the staff quarters and the staff quarters were surrounded by a bush. So my mother decided to go and do farming in that bush. My father loved my mother so much. And my father told my mother, you should not go digging because of these reasons. One, my father thought my mother would get old quickly. She would... Uh, I will say disintegrate or become old and she would no longer be the beautiful girl he used to see her. That was one. Secondly, given that my father was a teacher, he knew he would be transferred anytime. So he never wanted to be transferred and he leaves my mother's gardens. Then thirdly, it was somehow a shaming for a teacher, a teacher's wife to go digging. So my father stopped my mother from digging. And by the way, I remember my mother picked her hoe from her parents. So when my father stopped my mother from digging, my mother accepted. And what she did, she went onto my father's timetable for school and marked when my father would be in class. So during that time, 
When my father is in class, my mother would run to the bush and dig. Wow. So that is how my mother kept uh, dodging my father. But unfortunately, my father discovered it. So this one I'm talking, I, I'm the second born. I saw the whole story myself. So what my mother did, my mother went to her father, told, told him, the, and it tried to explain. Of course, I don't know what was in that meeting, but I remember there was a meeting and my father was told to leave my mother to go digging. After something like five months, I would like to tell you, we were harvesting Hang on, Josephine. It looks like we may have lost you. And beans. We said we, we may have lost you for oh, a sec there. I'm back. I'm back. Okay. Yes, we're back. I'm back. So, where was I? You you were talk. So you're talking about uh, after five months of of your uh, your mother doing that, and your father found out there was a there was a conversation that you're not sure what they said, and then you were getting to. Uh, what took place after that then? Yes, after my mother was given permission to go and dig, she went and grew maize, beans, and cassava. That, when the maize was harvested, that was the first time we had grilled maize at home. We celebrated. Our family was the only one with grilled maize. All wow. the households around did not have I would like to tell you, my father was the happiest to see us with grilled maize. We, he was no longer buying beans. Oh my goodness, that was the best year of it. So after that story, uh, my mother, my father, by the way, gave permission to my mother to keep digging. And my mother was not coming from far away to that school. So my mother told my father that in case they give us a, uh, uh, in case they they give us a, as a transfer, my mother will go and start their place and then come and harvest her crops and then follow my father. But I would like to tell you, my father was not transferred until when he was he retired. Ah, okay. <laughs> so yeah, we were never never transferred. Nevertheless, so my mother got permission. She started digging. We started harvesting crops. After the first harvest, all the families around started growing crops. That's and awesome. af after something like four years, the land was infertile. And remember, we were growing. So what my mother did was to talk to my father, get some money. One of the things I remember or I know very well is that when my mother needed money, my father supported her with the money. So she went and bought in the village. Uh, the village was around three miles away from where we were. How many kilometers were those Robert? Three miles away. Yeah, six kilometers from where we are. So my mother bought land because this land had become barren, it was no longer productive, and she went there. My father told him that, you know what, that is a village for him he was teaching. He was not going to stay in the village. So my mother stayed there, worked, did everything. At first she used to ride a bicycle to that place until she got uh, tired, built a shack there, but we had the food. Now, when he went there, he started thinking outside the box. Of course, we were also growing up. So the land was fertile. She, she had the food and now she needed the money. So what she did, she started growing vegetables. Now, I remember she started by growing tomatoes. When she grew the tomatoes, they were highly affected by diseases. My mother never gave up. She kept pushing, pushing on. Actually, that is one thing I learned from her. The moment something failed, that one gave her chance to keep moving on with it. So she grew the tomatoes. 
Sometimes the tomatoes would perform well, sometimes they would not perform well. Now, incidentally, she discovered that the tomatoes were doing well during the dry season and the cabbages were doing well during the wet season. So she resorted to growing cabbages during the wet season and tomatoes during the dry season. One thing I remember vividly is we, one, some of the days we would wake up when the whole tomato field has a burnt appearance. And me and my brothers and sisters we would say there was bad omen in the garden. We, no one would stop, step there. We would fear the garden. We didn't know that it was tomato blight. And neither my mother knew. At that time, there were no drugs. We didn't know what to do. There were no extension workers. So at that time, after my mother grew the tomatoes during the dry season and the cabbages during the wet season, by the way, in the dry season, we fetched water. Oh my God. Because she had to irrigate the tomatoes, we used it to fetch water from the time the tomatoes are in the nursery bed up to the time when the tomatoes are harvested. But she would get some good money. So she got some money, saved some money, and now she wanted to expand her business. So what she did, she went and bought chicken. Awesome. Now, from the tomato savings from the tomatoes and the cabbages, she went and bought chicken. That was one of the best things we did because we had a lot of food. So she bought chicken so that she sells off uh, the eggs. And I remember our house at home was made up of four sections. So she made sure that in each and every corner, she would put a chicken that is laying. And all of us would be at the watch out because uh, we knew if we leave those eggs there, the chicken would become broody. But the moment we kept picking the eggs, the chicken would lay and lay and lay as it tries to make sure that the eggs become many to get many chicks. So for us, we would keep picking, keep picking. Eh, my connection is unstable. Are you getting me? Yeah, you're good on my end, yep. Yes, so we enjoyed picking the eggs. Now, uh, the roof of our house, the, our house was like this. It was roofed with grass. The walls were made up of mud and the house was made up of four rooms. And now whenever it rained, the rain would go through the roof and then into the corners, it would wet the laying nest. And now when the chicken went and laid the eggs, the eggs were soiled. And to make matters worse, my mother did not have egg trays. So she picked these eggs and kept them into millet grain. So she had a very big basket of millet grain where she would keep these eggs. She would keep these eggs. Remember, the conditions are warm. Now, whenever the eggs were soiled, she would wash them so that the customers are happy. So she would first wash the eggs, wipe them well, and then put them into the millet grain. Ask me what happened, my dear. The what? conditions were warm, so the eggs got rotten. Now, yeah. okay. when we went, when the eggs were taken for selling, you know, when mom is doing everything, for example, when I'm for this meeting, everyone at home knows that mom is for a meeting, we should not disturb her, mom is doing this. I remember one time my son asked me, mommy, why don't you give out soya bean for free to people? I told him I didn't have money to buy people soya bean. So mom, everyone knows what mom is doing. So everyone was involved in what mom was doing. And now when we were waiting for mom to get a lot of money from the eggs, ask me what happened. What the happened? eggs were rotten. Yeah. Oh my God. Ugh. That was one of the hardest moments 
accepting. Um, so I always, whenever I think about my mother's determination, I really don't understand it. So what she did, she accepted the eggs were rotten and she moved on. Now, when she moved on, she decided now this time, she's not going to wait for the eggs to stay for long. What she's going to do, she will be selling the eggs as they come. So she accumulated the money. Now she was getting money from the vegetables. She was getting money from the eggs. And then she got some savings from there. By the way, whenever she got money, she supported us go to school. She supplemented my father's income. So as Amazing. money would be got from, the, from my father's salary, my mother would make additions or buy some requirements, and then we go to school. Now, with the income from the eggs and the tomatoes, she bought to the goats. Now, the goats that she bought, the kids would die, the goats would never grow, the goats were local. The goats did not perform well she sold off the goats. Now, when she sold off the goats, she bought two cows. Now, my mother is from Western Uganda and my father is from Central Uganda. Now in Central Uganda, people at that time were not keeping cattle. So here my mother was buying cattle. My father told him, for us, the Baganda, we don't keep cattle. So don't bring your cattle at home, your cows at home. My mother first kept his cow, her cows from somewhere. They stayed there, the calves would not grow, they would die, and she would manage the cows from a friend's place. But then when there was that war, the war which brought the current president, the current president is associated with a, with a certain area where they keep long horned cows. Okay. Now one of the cows was long horned. So they told my mother to sell off the cow and take her money because whoever had long horned cows was going to be killed. My mother said, no, I'm not selling off my cow. Let me stay with it. She talked to my father and she brought the cows at home. Yes, we, now we had cows at home. We had the cows. So we used to take them to the bush and tie them with a rope in the bush. So they were taken there in the morning and picked in the evening. The cows were so lovely. Now, one day as the cows were being picked from the bush, they came jumping. And now as they jumped, as they played, one of the cow got its leg broken. Jeez. We didn't have any veterinarian. We didn't have any help. We were there. So what my mother did was to get, uh, I remember it was the front right leg. So she got sticks tied around the the affected part towards the joint, and then got some sticks and put sticks around to keep the cow in one place. One thing I remember is the medication she gave this cow was paracetamol, a pan panado. She, she got panados and put them in, in a jackfruit thing and then gave the cow. But even up to now, when I ask her, was it really useful? She says yes, but I don't, it was not, it was not. So instead the cow get, got well, <coughs> excuse me. That's amazing. But, <coughs> but then the, these cows, we never used it to spray. First of all, it was war time. There were no shops open. Secondly, we didn't know what to do. So these cows, Gave, gave birth to calves and now these calves would die. Now, 
these curves would get East Coast fever. For us, we didn't know that it was East Coast fever. When a calf was born, we would not give it chance to suckle a lot of milk. We thought it was the milk that brought diseases. A lot of milk would make the calves sick. So what would ensure is we make sure as they are milking, we limit the amount of milk the calf gets. We never used it to spray. And this East Coast fever used it to manifest with the swollen lymph nodes. So what we would do is to get, we have a, a weed that we would put on the swollen lymph node and then the skin would peel off and the calf would have a very big red wound. Remember the calf is not having enough milk. Now it has a wound, it is getting infection the calf would die. Yet we loved these calves so much. So the animals at home, the cows at home never multiplied. However, we kept on uh, those ones that would survive would survive and we kept on keeping the chicken. Now for all that time, since I was born, I had never, never, left my parents. It was time for me to go to high school. Now, at this time, I needed to get everything new. <clears throat> my parents collected all the money they had. My parents did everything to give me the best they could. I would like to inform everyone, I am not an orphan. All my parents are there. My father did everything he could to support us to keep me in school, but the money was not enough. That is why sometimes I oppose supporting orphans only, because for me, I was not an orphan. So they collected all the money, paid the school fees, but when they collected this money, it was not enough. So my mother decided that she needed to give up the other cow. You remember the other cow whose leg was broken. Yes. It was sold off when I was going to high school. So the cow was sold off. Uh, my father got, got all his earnings. Remember we were eight. My mother added her money and I went to school. My parents knew they had given me the best that I needed. And indeed they had. They missed two things. They missed giving me two things. They missed giving me a pair of sandals and a towel. Now the pair of sandals was needed for me to go and have showers. Now in Uganda, the showers are not into the building. They are constructed somewhere outside with the toilets. Okay. So you go outside there and have a shower. And in most cases, they are not hygienic. And by the way, since everything was new, I had only two dresses, by the way, I was very happy. That was my very first time to put on shoes every day, to have shoes. I never had shoes. That was my very first time I had shoes. That was my very first time I left my parents. You know, so, so many things happened. So I go to school, I don't have sandals and I don't have a towel. Now comes time for having a shower. I would go barefooted to the showers. After having a shower, I would put my dress directly without wiping myself. I was teased. Remember at home, my father loved me so much. At home, everything was good. We used to share a bed, you know, there was no problem. But here I was being teased, being bullied all the, every day. I would either be the one to shower last or to make sure I shower very early. 
But I, whenever I would be coming from the showers, the children or my fellow girls would surround me, tease me, bull me. One time I tried to go back home and explain. My parents never listened to me because they had give, paid the school fees. They had paid everything. They didn't know that those two things, a pair of sandals was for 1,500 shillings that time. And a towel was for, I think, 5,000 Uganda shillings. Yes, but I didn't have those things. I resorted to having a shower early, but the dormitories are locked. So they open the dormitories when all the girls come back. There is no way you can ex escape. When I have a shower late, the dormitories would be closed. You know, the situation was tricky. So I decided, okay. no, the situation was bad. The girls were laughing at me. I remember for me, I'm not a sickly person. That was the time I spent at school sickly. Actually, even the school administration thought I had a problem. No, it was because I was being teased. So one time, as I tried to plan how to escape from school, there were two girls. As girls had surrounded me, laughing at me, bullying me, doing everything, two girls came. One of the hands gave me a pair of sandals and another hand gave me a towel. Wow. And the girls asked her, the, these girls asked the girls that had surrounded me, for all that time you've laughed at this girl, she has not left the school. Do you think you're, think you're doing good? Then they told me, have this. I was new, my self-esteem was low. I never, 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 realized or came to know who helped me. Really? So when I got those things, I stayed in school. I started feeling free going for showers and I stayed in school. I studied. At that time, I never, I wanted to become a medical doctor, but I never performed well. So at that time, when examinations came back, I had not performed well. I decided to go and study veterinary so that I can know why my mother's eggs got rotten, what killed my mother's calves, what kind of treatment my mother's calves needed, and why everything was going on at home the way it was going on. If those calves were not dying, maybe they would have sold two cows and given me a, a towel and the sandals. And then from there, I went to study veterinary. So for now, I'm going to stop here. The next episode will start from there and then go up to when the organization was established. Awesome. That is why I call my mother a hero. Now, because of what my mother did, yes, my mother didn't go to school, but she was able to think outside the box. At home, we used to call her the master planner. That is why Agric Uganda, especially I, feel empowering a woman at home will benefit the children first, and everyone at home. Because whatever my mom did benefited everyone at home. So that is why women are at the center of everything that we do, of everything that I do, because of my mother's history. Now, why vegetables and why mushrooms? My mother, my mother was involved in vegetable growing and I saw her making profits from vegetable growing, making profits from agriculture production. For now, let me stop here. Let's meet another time. Thank you so much for watching. Okay. Thank you, Josephine. And that, that is 
amazing how you the the stories of when you were living at home and you had all the troubles and problems you ran into with the animals with the chicken eggs rotting and the the calves not surviving and the calf breaking its legs seeing how that inspired you to become a veterinarian and to to learn how to troubleshoot and solve those problems and then help go back home and help your mom and the other women uh learn those things as well that that is just incredible and hearing about the the troubles you went to you went through when you first got to school and how you were bullied um but you stuck with it and came out the other side is very inspiring because just from interacting with you i mean you are an absolute light and a, you're an angel josephine and just the the energy you bring is is very very inspiring and so hearing some of the early stage problems you went through that uh, were catalysts for the growth and I've turned you into the person you are today has been extremely insightful. And I just want to thank you for sharing all of that um, with us and with our community. And I am very much looking forward to our next episode where we get to hear the rest of your story up until EcoAgric was started and, and all of that. I'm very much looking forward to that. So I just want to thank you, Josephine, for, for uh, the story of your life up to that point. And then we'll get together again very soon to to continue the rest of this conversation so we can learn the rest of everything that happened up until EcoAgric was founded. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for listening and watching this. I don't know whether it will be watched or listened, but thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much by the fire. I always want to tell people why whatever is done has a reason to why it is done. Why the books? Why women? Why scholarships? Why this? Yes. Thank you very much, Josephine. And everybody, we will see you very soon in the next episode that will be coming shortly. So on thank behalf you. Of, yes, on behalf of Josephine and I, thank you for checking this out, and we will see you all very soon. Thank you.